All right, we're reading Arden. <clears throat> Arden uh, chapter one, I guess. All right, matrices play a central... So chapter one is matrices. This is Arden's algebra. Uh, some quote in German. I, I can't I can't read German, so... Matrices play a central role in this book. They form an important part of the theory, and many concrete examples are based on them. Therefore, it is essential to develop facility in matrix manipulation. Uh, that's weird grammar. Since matrices pervade mathematics, the techniques you will need are sure to be useful elsewhere. Section 1.1, the basic operations. Let M and N be positive integers. An M times N matrix, or M by N matrix, is a collection of M times N numbers arranged in a rectangular array. And here we go. So there's M rows and N columns. So it's row times column. Um, I remember, I thought this was so stupid, but it, it was like the first programming textbook I ever used. Um, and it was explaining matrix multiplication. And uh, the way it, the way it uh, had you remember that it was rows times columns was RC cola. And I thought it was so stupid, but I remember, but I still remember that. So I don't know. Um, anyway, for example, the matrix 2, 1, 0, 1, 3, 5 is a 2 by 3 matrix, two rows and three columns. We usually introduce a symbol such as capital A to introduce the matrix, or inter to denote a matrix. The numbers in a matrix are the matrix entries. They may be denoted by A sub IJ, or AIJ, where I and J are indices, integers, with 1 less than or equal to I, less than or equal to M, and 1 less than or equal to J, less than or equal to N. The index I is the row index, and J is the column index. So A sub IJ is the entry that appears in the ith row and jth column of the matrix. And here you go, so ith row, jth column. Footnote 1, this is the opening sense of Euler's book, Algebra, which was published in St. Petersburg in 1770, which I guess is this quote up here. In the above example, uh, this matrix, A11 equals 2, and A13 equals 0, and A23 equals 5. So, yep. We sometimes denote... a the matrix whose entries are A sub IJ by parens A sub IJ, open paren A sub IJ, close paren. An N by N matrix is called a square matrix. A one by one matrix A contains a single number and we do not distinguish such a matrix from its entry. A one by N matrix is an N dimensional row vector. We drop the index I when M is equal to one and write a row vector as A1 up to AN or as the tuple a1 comma dots an comma an commas in such in such a row vector are optional so one by n is one row n columns um, an m similarly an m by one matrix is an m dimensional column vector um, which is b1 up to bm In most of this book, we won't make a distinction between an n-dimensional column vector and the point of n-dimensional space with the same coordinates. In the few places where the distinction is useful, we will state this clearly. Addition of matrices is defined in the same way as vector addition. Let A equals parens AIJ and B equals open paren B sub IJ close paren B2 M by N matrices. Their sum a plus B is the M times N matrix S equals S sub IJ, defined by S sub IJ equals A sub IJ plus B sub IJ. Thus, the matrix 2, 1, 0, 1, 3, 5, right, so you just do component-wise addition. So 2, 1, 0, 1, 3, 5, so 2 plus 1, can you, man, that pointer is so small. Is there a way to make it bigger? Two, that's too big. Let's try the smallest size. Wow, I can't see this. Two plus one, let me get the uh, pad, drawing pad. Where's the 
square. There we are. 2 plus 1 is equal to 3. 1 plus 0 is equal to 1. 0 plus 3 is equal to 3. 1 plus 4 is equal to 5. 3 plus minus 3 is equal to 0. And 5 plus 1 is equal to 6. Addition is defined only when the matrices to be added have the same shape when they are m by n matrices with the same m and n. So, as long as they have the same shape. Scalar multiplication of a matrix by a number is also defined as with vectors. The result of multiplying an m by n matrix A by a number C is another m by n matrix B, where you just multiply each entry by the scalar. So, you multiply 2 by this matrix, you get 2 times each entry. Numbers will also be referred to as scalars. Let's assume for now that the scalars are real numbers. Ugh. In later chapters, other scalars will appear. Just keep in mind that, except for occasional reference to the geometry of t real two- or three-dimensional space, everything in this chapter continues to hold when the scalars are complex numbers. I feel like I've got a bug in my mouth. I swallow a fly, maybe. <coughs> That's really unpleasant. <clears throat> anyway, the complicated operation is matrix multiplication. The first case to learn is the product A times B of a row vector A and column vector B, which is defined when both are the same size, say M. The entries of A and B are denoted by AI and BI, respectively. The product AB is the 1 by 1 matrix or scalar A1B1 plus A2B2, so the dot product. So, so here's a row vector times a column vector. 1 times 1 plus minus 1 times 3 plus 4 times 5 is 1 minus 3 plus 20, which is 18. <sighs> The usefulness of this definition becomes apparent when we regard A and B. What is going on? Anyway, usefulness of this definition becomes apparent when we regard A and B as vectors that represent indexed quantities. For example, consider a candy bar containing M ingredients. Let A sub I denote the number of grams of ingredient sub I per bar, and let B sub I denote the cost of ingredient I per gram. The matrix product A times B computes the cost per bar. And so if you, in units, grams per bar times cost per gram, gram cancels out, so it'll give you cost per bar. In general, The product of two matrices, A equals A sub IJ and B equals BIJ, is defined when the number of columns of A is equal to the number of rows of B. So this is a good way to remind, remind yourself. Um, so if A is an L by M matrix and B is an M by N matrix, the product will be... Really? My cat always shows up when I'm recording. Hey, come here. Anyway, then the product will be an L by N matrix. Symbolically, L by M times N by N is equal to L by N. The entries of the product matrix are computed by multiplying all rows of A by all columns of B using the rule 1.1.2. Where's 1.1.2? This, okay. So if we denote the product matrix AB by P equals P sub IJ, Sorry, my cat is rubbing, rubbing your cheeks against the microphone, so you might hear that. Anyway, um, by P equals PIJ, then PIJ equals A. Yeah, this is a very confusing formula. But generally, P, the product, the IJth entry in the product, is the ith row of A 
dot product the jth row of um, b. Hey, sweetie. Um, so, here's a symbol. The ith row of j dot the dot the bth row bth column of b or the ith row of a dot the jth column of b is the ijth entry of the product. For instance, two one zero times one minus one four is equal to one eighteen. So two times one minus one times one plus four times zero. So that'll give you one for the first entry. One times one minus three times one plus four times five. So that's one minus three, that's minus two plus 20 is 18. So this matches. This definition of, so let me get a straight cat. My cat is, anyway. This definition of matrix multiplication has turned out to provide a very convenient computational tool. Going back to our candy bar example, suppose that there are L candy bars. We may form the L by M matrix A, whose ith row measures the ingredients of bar sub i. If the cost is to be computed each year for n years, we may form the M by N matrix B, whose jth column measures the cost of the ingredients in year sub j. Let's read that again. This definition of matrix multiplication has turned out to provide a very convenient computational tool. Going back to our candy bar example, suppose that there are L candy bars. We may form the L by M matrix A, whose ith row measures the ingredients of bar sub i. If the cost is to be computed each year for n years, we may form the M by N matrix B, whose jth column measures the cost of ingredients in year sub j. Again, the matrix product A times B equals P computes the cost per bar, cost of bar i in years j. Okay. I, I'm not, I can't visualize that right now for some reason. Anyway, um, I don't like this array nonsense. Um, I prefer data structures over arrays, and unfortunately this sort of array formulation of matrices is dominant in mathematics even though it's it's just arrays suck because they're I mean you, you have to do all this index juggling and, and nobody likes that um, one reason for the matrix notation is to provide a shorthand way of writing linear equations the system of equations a11 to x1 plus up to a1n xn equals b1 right so you're trying to find x the so a the a's and b's are given and the x's are variables okay and you're trying to find the set x1 up to xn such that every single equation there is true you can write this in matrix notation as ax equals b where a denotes the matrix of coefficients x and b are column vectors so exactly like this and ax is the matrix product we may for refer to an equation of this form simply as an equation or as a system. The matrix equation 2, 1, 0, 1, 3, 5 times x1, x2, x3, 1, 18 represents the following system of two equations and three unknowns. 2x1 plus x2 equals 1, x1 plus 3x2 plus 5x3 equals 18. Equation 1.1.4, which one is that? That's this one, okay exhibits one solution, x equals one, x two equals minus one, and x three equals four. There are others. The sum 1.1.3 that defines the product matrix can also be written in summation or sigma notation as, as um, p sub i j equals the sum from v equals one to, I guess that's new. Anyway, v equals one to m, a sub i v times b sub v j equals the sum over v of a sub i v b sub v j. Maybe it's new. It doesn't look like v, it looks like new. Anyway, each of these expressions for pij is a shorthand notation for the sum. The large sigma indicates that the terms with indices v equals 1 up to m are to be added up. <sighs> what is your problem?
my cat is stuck in the carpet and anyway where was I it is assumed that the reader will understand that if a is an L by M matrix and B is a M by N matrix the indices should run from 1 to M we've used the Greek letter new so it is new as an uncommon symbol elsewhere to distinguish the index of summation clearly. Our two most important notations for handling sets of numbers are the summation notation as used above and matrix notation. The summation notation is, more, is the more versatile of the two, but because matrices are more compact, we use... The... What is your problem? Come here. Come here. The summation notation is the more versatile of the two, but because matrices are more compact, we use them whenever possible. Hopefully you can still hear me. One of our tasks in later chapters will be to translate complicated mathematical structures into matrix notation in order to be able to work with them conveniently. Various identities are satisfied by the matrix operations. The distributive laws, A times B plus B prime equals AB plus AB prime, and a plus a prime times b equals a b plus a prime b, and the associative law a b times c is equal to a times b c are among them. These laws hold whenever the matrices involved have suitable sizes so that the operations are defined. For the associative laws, the sizes should be a equals l times m, b equals m times n, and c equals n times p for some l, m, n, and p. Since the two products 1.1.8 are equal, parentheses are not necessary, and we will denote the triple product by ABC. Is an L by P matrix, because right, you have an L here and a P at the end, the internal indices will cancel, or the internal shapes will cancel out. Um, for example, the two ways of computing the triple product, ABC equals 1, 2 times 101, times that two zero one one zero one are a b times c cat just knocked over the microphone sorry um a b a b times c equals one zero one two zero two times two zero one one zero one equals two one four two and a times b c equals one two times two one equals 2142. Scalar multiplication is compatible with matrix multiplication in the obvious sense. Um, C times... What is wrong with you? You're, you're very sweet. Say love. Should I be paying attention to you instead of doing math? Scalar multiplication is compatible with matrix multiplication in the obvious sense. C times AB, so yeah, it commutes. That's interesting. Anyway, C times AB equals CA times B equals A times CB. Oh my god. Proofs of these identities are straightforward and not very interesting. Lovely. However, the commutative law does not hold for me. Okay. What do you want? I already fed you. The commutative law does not hold for matrix multiplication. That is, A times B is not equal to B times A, usually. Even when both matrices are square, the two products tend to be different. For instance, 1100 0, 0 times 2011 equals 3100, 0, 0, while 2011 times 1100 0, 0 equals 2211, and those... <sighs> what? What? Here. Okay. Pick a side. What do you want? I already fed you. 
been fed. Shut the hell up. Can you do that? Ow! Jesus, man. I sound like I'm torturing my cat, but she just starts yelling and screaming for, you know, if you pet her. She's a real sweetheart. She's vocal. Anyway, if it happens that AB equals BA, the two matrices are said to commute. Since matrix multiplication isn't commutative, we must be careful when working with matrix equations. We can't multiply both sides of an equation B equals C on the left by a matrix A to conclude that AB equals AC. Yes, we can. We can. I read that as can't. It's can. Multiply both sides of a matrix of an equation B equals C on the left by matrix A. Yeah, you can do the same thing to both sides. To conclude that AB equals AC, provided that the products are defined similarly, if the product products are defined, we can conclude that BA equals CA. We cannot derive AB equals CA from B equals C. A matrix all of whose entries are zero is called a zero matrix. No, you can't get done. Because all you're going to do is meow at me until I pick you up again. So you're staying on my lap. A matrix all of whose entries are zero is called a zero matrix, and if there is no danger of confusion, it will be denoted simply by zero. The entries A sub II of a matrix are called are its diagonal entries. A matrix A is a diagonal matrix. Now note that this is the uh, northwest to southeast diagonal. So this diagonal. That's what is meant by the diagonal, the north, no, northwest to southeast. A matrix A is diagonal matrix if its only non-zero entries are diagonal entries. The word non-zero simply means different from zero. It is ugly, but so convenient that we will use it frequently. The diagonal n by n matrix, all of whose di diagonal entries are equal to 1, is called the n by n identity matrix and is denoted by I sub n. It behaves like the number 1 in multiplication. No! No! Nope! 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 You're saying... <coughs> Would you shut up? If A is an M by N matrix, then A, A times... <sighs> okay. <sighs> then A I N is equal to A, and I M times A, right, M by N is A. Then I M times A is equal to A. We usually omit the subscript and write I for I sub N. Here are some shorthand ways of depicting the identity matrix. Oh no, my cat found some cellophane. She loves cellophane. Anyway, uh, we often indicate that a whole region in a matrix consists of zeros by leaving it blank or just putting in a single zero. We use the asterisk to indicate an arbitrary undetermined entry of a matrix, thus, thus this nonsense may denote a square matrix A whose entries below the diagonal are zero and other entries being undetermined. <clears throat> Such a matrix is called upper triangular. The matrices that appear in 1.14 below are upper triangular. Let's look at that. Right, these are upper triangular. Okay. Let A be a square n by n matrix. If there is a matrix B such that A times B equals I sub n and B times A equals I sub n, then B is called an inverse of A and is denoted by A inverse. A inverse A equals I equals A times A inverse. Matrix A that has an inverse is called an invertible matrix. For example, the matrix A equals 2, 1, 5, 3 is invertible. Its inverse is A inverse equals 3 minus 1 minus 5, 2, as can be seen by computing the products A, A inverse and A inverse A. Two more examples. 1, 2 inverse is equal to 1, 1 half. Generally, the inverse of a diagonal matrix, you just take 1 over each diagonal in the same order. 
and 1, 1, 0, 1 inverse is equal to 1 minus 1, 0, 1. We will see later that a square matrix A is invertible if there is a matrix B such that either one of the two relations A, B equals I, sub, I sub N or B, A equals I sub N holds, and that B is then the inverse. C 1.2.20, no. But since multiplication of matrices isn't commutative, this fact is not obvious. On the other hand, an inverse is unique if it exists. The next lemma shows that there can only be one inverse of a matrix A. Lemma 1.1.5. How much time, how much do we have left? Oh my god. Okay, just like two more pages. Let A be a square matrix that has a right inverse, a matrix R such that A times R equals I, and also a left inverse, a matrix L such that L times A equals I. Then R equals L, so A is invertible and R is its inverse. Proof R is equal to I times R, which is equal to L times A times R, which is equal to L A times R, or L times A R, which is equal to L times I, which is equal to L. Proposition 1.1.1. 1.1.16. Let A and B equal B invertible n by n matrices. The product AB and the inverse A inverse are invertible. AB inverse is equal to B inverse A inverse, and A inverse inverse equals A. If A1 up through AM are invertible n by n matrices, the product A1 up to AM is invertible, and its inverse is AM inverse down to A1 inverse. Proof. Assume that A and B are invertible. To show that the product B inverse A inverse equals Q is the inverse of AB equals P, we simplify the products PQ and QP, obtaining I in both cases. So A times B times B inverse times A inverse, the B times B inverse will cancel, the A times A inverse will cancel, um, and then if you do it in the opposite order, same thing happens. So let me write that down. So. Well, these B's cancel, and then the A's cancel. Same thing. Uh, the inverse of verification of the other assertions, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. It's just canceling. It's kind of obvious when you write it down. The inverse of 1, 2 times 1, 1, 0, 1 equals 1, 1, 0, 2 is, yeah, it's the product of the inverse matrices in the reverse order. Yeah, so 1, 1, 0, 1 inverse is 1 minus 1, 0, 1. And the inverse of this, of 1, 2, is 1, 1 half. Take the product, take the product of the inverses in the opposite order. You get 1 minus a half, a half. And I, I'm not going to check that that's the inverse. Anyway, it's worthwhile to memorize the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. A, B, C, D inverse is equal to 1 over AD minus BC times D minus B minus CA. The denominator AD minus BC is called the determinant of the matrix. If the determinant is 0, the matrix is not invertible. We discussed determinants in section 1.4. Though this isn't clear from the definition of matrix multiplication, we will see that most square matrices are invertible, through, though finding the inverse explicitly is not a simple problem when the matrix is large. The set of all invertible n by n matrices is called the n-dimensional general linear group. It will be one of our most important examples when we introduce the basic concept of a group in the next chapter. For future reference, we note the following lemma. Lemma 1.1.18. A square matrix that has either a row of zeros or a column of zeros is not invertible. Proof. If a row of an n by n matrix A is zero, and if B is any other n by n matrix, then the corresponding row of the product AB is 0, 2. So A, right, so AB is not the identity because you need a 1 in the diagonal. And so if you have, like, let's, so what this is saying, where is my pointer? Here we are. So if this is 0, so if this row is all zeros, this is in A, and then in B, you have a column dot this row row so yeah let, let, let's so if you have a bunch of zeros here and then every column of B 
dotted with this is going to be zero. So the, the row in the product is going to be this column dot this row, this column dot this row, this column, and every single every single entry in that row is going to be zeros, but the identity matrix, one of these has to be one. It's It's got to be, you know, on the diagonal. So A times B is not the identity matrix, because the identity matrix cannot have a row that is all zeros. Therefore, A has no right inverse. Similar argument shows that if A a column of A is zero, then A has no left inverse. Um, let's see. Block multiplication. Various tricks simplify matrix multiplication in favorable cases. Block multiplication is one of them. Let M and M prime be N by N and N times P matrices, and let R be an integer less than N. We may decompose the two matrices into blocks as follows. M equals A b and b m prime equals a prime b prime where a has r columns and a prime has r rows then the matrix product can be computed as m m prime equals a a prime plus b b prime notice that this formula is the same as the rule for multiplying a row vector and a column vector we may also multiply matrices divided into four blocks suppose that we de decompose an M by N matrix M and an N by P matrix M prime into rectangular submatrices M equals A, B, C, D, M prime equals A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime, where the number of columns of A and C are equal to the number of rows of A prime and B prime. In this case, the rule for block multiplication is the same as row multiplication of two by two matrices. So A B, C, D times A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime is equal to A, A prime plus B, C prime. So this dot this goes here. Row one dot column one is row one column. Row one dot column two, A, A B prime plus B, D prime, C, A prime plus D, C prime, C, B prime plus D, D prime. These rules can be verified directly from the definition of matrix multiplication. No, thank you. Um, I'm not going to do that. Please use block multiplication. No, I'm not going to do that. I just don't feel like it. I, I just don't. Um, to verify the equation... Uh, should I... Anyway, besides facilitating computations, block multiplication is a useful tool for proving facts about matrices by induction. I'm just tired. I want to go to bed. How much longer do we have? This is 1.2. All right, last section, matrix units. The matrix units are the simplest non-zero matrices. The M by N matrix unit E sub IJ has a 1 in the IJ position as its only non-zero entry. We usually denote matrices by uppercase capital letters, but the use of a lowercase letter for a matrix unit is traditional. The set of matrix units is called a basis for the space of all m by n matrices, because all because every m by n matrix A equals A i j is a linear combination of the matrices E i j, right? Right. So A is equal to A one one E one one plus A one two E one two. The set of m by n matrices, by the way, is a vector space because you can just add them, there's zero. Um, you can multiply them by constants, that's a vector space. The indices ij under the sigma mean the sum is taken over all i equals one up to m, and all j equals one up to n. So for instance, three, two, one, four is equal to, yeah, it's obvious. The product of an m by n matrix unit eij and an n by p matrix unit ejl is given by the formulas eij ejl equals eil and eij ekl equals zero if i is, if j is not equal to k right that's interesting
the column vector EI, which has a single non-zero entry one in the position I, is analogous to a matrix unit. And the set E1 through EN of these vectors forms what is called the standard basis of the n-dimensional space Rn. See chapter 3, 3.4.15. If x is a column vector with entries x1 up to xn, then x equals x1 e1 plus xn en equals the sum over i of xi sub ei. The formulas for multiplying matrix unix and standard basis vectors are eij ej equals ei and eij ek equals zero if j is not equal to k. All right, that's enough. Whew, I am bored out of my fucking... I'm not bored, I just know I, I want to get to the part that I don't know yet because I'm not very good at algebra. That's why I'm doing this. Anyway, that's enough. Thank you for listening.